thanks for having me along. Um, it's hard to know where to start with all of this. <clears throat> I'll try to give a thumbnail sketch of the last 50 years of Middle Eastern politics. And even doing a thumbnail sketch, we'll be here till next Wednesday. So I'll give a bit of background on the lead up to the events in Tunisia and Egypt, but try to give that quite a sort of a broad based context <clears throat> to understand the significance of the events and then maybe look at why events have sort of manifested the way they have over the last month or two and that might sort of cast a bit of light backwards in terms of why we've seen unrest in some places and not in others, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. <clears throat> so I guess two points that I think are, or two to three points that I think are really, really important in understanding what's gone on in the last three, four months across the Middle East. Firstly, and as a sort of a foundational point, I've got a map up here of the greater Middle East, but we're really talking about the Arab world. Again, if I'm telling you to suck eggs in terms of some of this basic information, just throw something at me, tell me to move on. But um, talking about the Arab world, western border obviously here through the Gulf and then through North Africa. This is really the core. We, we've seen unrest in Iran, but really the unrest we've seen in Iran is a continuation of a slightly different dynamic. So if we're looking at the Arab world as such, it is, it is a region that has been defined by autocratic or dictatorial governments since independence. This is really, really important as a foundational point. So the, the, the governments that have been in place have been in place for a long time, largely backed by the army, state security services, overt repression of opposition forces, also co-option and division of opposition forces. So these regimes haven't survived just through using security services to smash up the opposition, although that has been present. Egypt's a really interesting case here. You do get regimes that will co-opt or attempt to co-opt large sections of the middle class, make them dependent on the regime. So it's through things like network, patronage networks, highly personalised rule, Prominent industry figures will be personally linked to a figure in the regime and dependent on that figure for all the concrete contracts in Cairo's new real estate development, for instance. And that person is quite an, quite an important figure socially and economically. You sort of get that downstream personalised patronage control as well. So there's co-option, division and direct repression. Externally, this has been supported by... Um, well, during the Cold War, I get old, obviously feel older and older every year. I don't know how many of you guys are children of the Cold War like me, um, <clears throat> but I distinctly remember the days of the Cold War division of the region, where you had the Soviet Union supporting a group of countries and the United States supporting a group of countries. This logic's not so relevant today, but it is important, I think, to contextualise as well. You had Again, really broad brushstroke caricature here. You had two types of autocracies or dictatorships in the region that still do survive today to some extent. What's known as sort of an Arab Republic, or you know, Republican model, president, etc., etc. Those countries included Algeria, Tunisia. Libya is a bit of an exception here, and I'll come back to that. Egypt, um, Iraq, Syria, and to some extent Lebanon. And Generally, those republics during the Cold War were supported by the Soviet Union. Egypt, up until the mid-80s particularly. Algeria, sort of on and off through the 80s and 90s. Um, Syria, definitely. Iraq, definitely, before 2003. But, you know, Soviet Union collapsed in the 90s. They were considered these sort of radical nationalist republican governments. But they, they would often have democratic in the title, as Libya does, but they're not democratic at all. The other camp were what are sometimes known as sort of traditional monarchies or conservative monarchies, and these were generally supported by the United States. So you've got the Saudis, the Gulf states. The Gulf states themselves, Kuwait only achieved independence from Britain in 1961, and the UAE, Bahrain and Qatar in 1971. So these are very new countries as well. Um, Morocco was one of these, Oman, uh, Yemen through the 80s anyway, and Jordan. So there was a kind of a split, but external efforts to prop up these dictatorships as a general rule. You've also got another factor obviously overlaid into this. Well, there's a, there's a, some, some history here that I think needs unpacking as well. 
Tr I'm not sure. Even just as an opening, has anyone seen Lawrence of Arabia? As a general thing? What that movie is about is World War I, post World War I period where we get the creation of the political map we see today. And we notice that the Arab states are divided up into 22 different countries. There was a movement and still a movement at seeking to create a unified single Arab state. And there was an intense level of external interference that led to, or played a great part in the creation of a range of divided states that we see today. And this fed into a sense of suspicion of external involvement, a sense of betrayal by external powers, and in a lot of ways has come to form a lot of the political narrative in the Arab world. This notion of wariness of external interference, external interference carrying greater significance. Again, these are just some tr little vignettes I'm trying to drop. There's obviously a lot, much more to it than that. Um, oh, into this, um, we need to just quickly mention Israel. Israel was founded in 1948 after World War II. The rhetoric, you'll notice in terms of Arab rhetoric about Israel, it often refers to Israel as a colonial implant in the region, a further effort to divide the Arab people and make them weak, make them dependent on the outside world so they can exploit our oil, etc., etc. Again, this is, this is rhetoric. You know, depending on which side of the historical debate you fall on, you might sway one way or the other, but it, it has emerged from a particular historical context, a particular mode of external interference. So when we look at the revolutions and uprisings, or however you want to phrase them, going on now. This mention of external interference, even this morning with these British guys running around Libya and then getting arrested by the opposition forces, general sort of wackiness going on there, again, that gets folded and takes on added, added significance in the region. And so I think it's a really important thing to mention. So anyway, that's a bastardised <laughs> history of the Middle East in, in five minutes. Um, so we've had a long period since post-World War II period when these states became independent, some would argue not fully independent, still largely reliant on, on, the, on external powers, dependent on um, oil revenues, particularly in the Gulf, obviously, Bahrain slightly less so, but Iraq, Saudi, Kuwait, Qatar, UAE, also oil deposits in southern Algeria. These are your main Arab oil producing states. Um, a long period of autocratic rule, a long period of dictatorship, seemingly resistant to what were known as the second and third waves of democracy. Second wave of democracy, post-World War II period, third wave of democracy emerging, oh no, sorry, second wave was Latin America, third wave in the late 1980s in Eastern Europe. This notion that liberal, you know, I don't know if you have any of you have come across Fukuyama's, Francis Fukuyama's very controversial end of history. He was writing about the end of the Cold War, the triumph of liberal democracy. Inevitably, this would lead to the collapse of autocratic regimes. This was the highest form of human organisation possible. The Middle East was seemed incredibly impervious to this. Some would say as a result of, particularly after the end of the Cold War, Western powers wishing to maintain client regimes in the region in order to ensure stability, security for Israel and access to oil. Again, I'm not making a value judgment on this debate, but this is the, these are the terms of debate in the way this has been discussed, either or. Um, leading up to the last few years, we've seen some important changes. There has been challenges to this system previously. One really important one that doesn't get talked about a lot is Algeria in the late 1980s. Now in Algeria in the late 1980s you had a situation where well, amongst most of these states the sort of social contract that really existed was that the state would provide services relative levels of economic and political stability, at least rhetoric confrontation or you know, a, a certain rhetorical stance vis-a-vis -vis Israel and the West, or vis-a-vis -vis Israel primarily. But domestically, 
there would be a certain level of social welfare, provision of jobs, services, state-led development in exchange for political freedoms. That was the social contract, the very basic social contract. If you give up your freedoms, we'll make sure you get a job, we'll make sure that there's some level of access to housing, we will subsidise basic foodstuffs, etc, etc. This is our bargain. And this started to collapse in the region through the 1980s when you started to see the first signs of really large population growth, global recession, and declining sense of legitimacy amongst a lot of these regimes. And it first really manifested itself in Algeria. In Algeria, the government had been in power since independence in 1962. If you want to see a good movie on that period, Battle for Algiers, excellent, excellent movie. That single party regime, sort of based its legitimacy on its revolutionary confrontation to the French. You had a generational change. I didn't remember that sort of wartime history. The government started to falter, the economy fell in a heap. And so they removed the subsidies from basic foodstuffs and then there were riots throughout the country. Challenges to the central government. The government said, okay, if that's what you want, we'll impose changes. And they imposed a sweeping measure of political reforms, brought in multi-party elections, um, the ruling party stepped back, the president effectively resigned. It was quite unprecedented. What happened was that the party that... I mean, I'm not, I'm not saying this case for this example, but it's important to know that the party that actually won the electoral process or looked like it was going to sweep into power was an Islamist party, the Islamic Salvation Front, won the municipal elections and was on the verge of winning a two-thirds majority in the Legislative Assembly, which would have enabled it to change the constitution. The military stepped in in January 1992, cancelled the electoral results. That led to the outbreak of a civil war between the government and the Islamists that lasted 10 years and claimed over 200,000 lives. A really brutal civil war, allegations of state involvement in a lot of the atrocities, etc., etc. few things from that. So th this is a very similar context into which we've seen the current unrest today. In Tunisia, a lot of it was stuff that motivated the, the, uh, the unrest was uh, the removal of subsidies on food, similar to Egypt, similar to Yemen as well, and Jordan. Food prices, basic staples, which the government was supposed to provide as part of this social contract collapsed. Housing just wasn't available. Housing is a big issue in a conservative Muslim country you often get the case that a young guy needs a house in order to be able to you know, start a family. It's, it seems quite flippant, but these are, these are important social dynamics because a, a young man can't find a house, he can't find a job, he therefore can't move into that next stage of life. There is, you know, he and a very large cohort of his friends, young guys, there's a, a feeling of resentment that builds up. These expectations have been raised that the government will provide this and the government, you go out, you get your education, but the, and then the government doesn't provide it. What we saw in the 1980s and what we're seeing now also is a restriction on visas to Europe, so there was no opportunities for those young people to go outside the region to work. One Syrian playwright refers to this dynamic as young people being sentenced to hope. I mean, expectations raised and then the door closed in their face. Um, so a similar dynamic, the 1980s, which occurred again, which has been occurring again today. Global financial crisis, you know, these sort of rickety old regimes, with very little legitimacy, a very large young population. The thing that sparked it, though, was a, a very specific event, and I'm not trying to read too much into this event, but you probably come across it, it was the self-immolation of Mohammed Bouazizi in Tunisia. It's a young guy who was... Can you spell that? Yeah, it's B-O-U. A Z I Z I. It's on December 17 last year. Young guy is 26 years old. He um, was he was university educated, had five siblings, ailing parents. Basically, was the only provider for his family. So he was going out selling fruit in the very, very poor poor southern areas of Tunisia. Um, facing constant harassment by state security services who were saying, you, you need a licence. Well, I've got a licence. Well, the licence fees have changed. And they'll, basically, they were trying to get a cut of his takings. General harassment 
He tried to lodge official complaints. He tried to go through the state services to lodge complaints about this. And he was constantly rejected. And then his final application, he was actually physically assaulted in the offices. Went home, got a tank of petrol, went back to the municipal offices, doused himself in petrol and set himself on fire. It was an act of utter, utter, utter desperation that was the trigger for the riots in Tunisia, which started in the south, which spread to the whole country, which led to the downfall of the Ben Ali regime, which had been in power since 1986. So, yeah, not saying that this, you know, reading too much into this, but I think it was symbolic of this sense of desperation, which underlies a lot of these, this unrest at the moment. Desperation of young people who have been sentenced to hope in a context of dictatorial movements across the region who have been so very, very effective at directly oppressing, dividing and co-opting opposition. So when the, when the opposition did rise, when the revolts have risen up, they've been largely leaderless and organic. So it makes it very, very difficult for the government to put down because they can't target a particular person or group. Hopefully that long winding meandering narrative made sense. That, that's a really, really important part of it. It's that the government tried, you know, Ben Ali regime, Mubarak regime stepped in to try to quell these opposition forces. There was no one there to actually target. You know, sorry, trying to punch water. Very similar situation in Egypt. So this sense of desperation. And the other thing was fear. These two very intangible things. <clears throat> When, and I think we saw this much more in Egypt, and Egypt's a very particular circumstance, and we'll talk about that later, and I might just sum up on this point. It was at the point that not so much the army, but the protests in Egypt after they rose up in the wake of the Tunisian uprising and emerged to challenge the Mubarak regime, Mubarak had been in power since 1981, under a, a state of emergency, had suspended all rule of law in the country since 1981. Um, the army sat on the sidelines, but it was the internal security services, which really symbolised state repression. And it was a moment when, after about one or two weeks, the protesters in Tahrir Square, there was a second assault on the protesters, and the protesters didn't disperse. Fear no longer worked as part of the sort of oppressive arm of the government. And that broke a really important part of the way the government was able to maintain its authority. It was no longer feared. It was no longer feared and no longer respected. And that brought a breakdown of the social contract and then the breakdown of that key dynamic of dictatorial rule. And it was that that really, I think, was part of a catalytic factor in generating uprisings elsewhere. The situation is different from country to country, and we can maybe talk about that in, in terms of questions. Um, but that's essentially the way I read the situation. It is a really unprecedented series of events. I mean, this is, this is history unfolding. I don't, think, I don't see them as revolutions. I mean, the military is still in power in Egypt. The state machinery hasn't changed. The state machinery really, really hasn't changed in Tunisia. Um, Libya if the anti-Gaddafi forces are successful, um, we'll probably see a wholesale change in some respect. But this is, a, this is a, a quite a particular situation, and it is a full-scale civil war going on in the country at the moment. So what, what is going to emerge from this, we still don't know. But we can start to, through that, hopefully through that lens and that dynamic, you know, an organic leaderless uprising, very hard to quash, but does it have a vision for the future? Does it make it more susceptible to co-option by pre-existing dominant forces? I think so. Um, so that's sort of the tale of that. Now, I don't know if you want me to talk more about forward-looking or maybe people can ask. Yeah, yeah, cool, cool. Um, now, yeah, I used that example of Algeria with the Islams. I, I specifically mentioned that I didn't want to say that as an example because I don't think, and if you look at the track record of Islamist movements, particularly in elections generally, they don't do that well. So we are going to move toward some sort of electoral process in Egypt in September, or July maybe, but I think it'll be probably be with the original timetable in September. The Muslim Brotherhood, the Muslim Brotherhood was founded in Egypt in 1928, 
has been sort of on and off banned when the state of emergency was brought in in 1981. A lot of its movement, a lot of its leaders were in prison in the 50s and then in the 60s. In the 1980s, there was a new round of repression. It is the most cohesive single opposition party in Egypt, but I, it doesn't really mean that it is the single, you know, it is the key opposition force for mine. It is the single largest movement in that it's so well established in Egypt. And it is not really a political party as such. It was founded as a social movement. The principle of the Muslim Brotherhood is one of Islamicization from below. There were splits in the movement during the 1960s when you had these guys, you know, figures within the movement say, oh, this whole process of so slowly changing social mores that will inevitably lead to political change is slow and boring and ineffectual. We need to cut the head off and, you know, strike revolutionary change and then change politically from the top down. That, that, that was, they splintered off the Muslim Brotherhood. So the Muslim Brotherhood itself, there's a reason why, in that way, it is resilient in Egypt. Um, it gets spoken about a lot, it gets talked about a lot, and it gets brought up a lot, and that feeds into its mystique. And it will be present in elections, and it will have some success. But it will not come in with a two-thirds majority needed to change the constitution to Sharia law. That won't happen. It's very rare that He's a social, sort of quivering, fence-sitting social scientist says things equivocally, and I'll say that equivocally. I won't come out and say, you know, how much they will actually get, but Egypt is a... From my observations, Egypt is the most religiously observant society in the Arab world, more so than Saudi Arabia. There's a genuine level of religious observance in Egypt, rather than this very sort of strongly state-sponsored religiosity in Saudi Arabia and other states. Even then, the Muslim Brotherhood in, in itself is divided. It has many different wings and many different factions. But it will be there and it will be part of the Egyptian political landscape. But it won't come in and win 188 of 240 seats. That, that won't happen. There are other country movements. Egypt will be an intensely pluralistic, at least in the early stages, the electoral process will be intensely pluralistic, chaotic, and there won't be any one clear party that emerges. Elsewhere, Tunisia won't see an Islamist government. There will be Islamist participation there. There is, again, another Islamist movie, Anakta, or the Renaissance Party, um, which is an old, exiled opposition party led by Rashid Ganoushi. The older guard of Anakta, the older guard of the Muslim Brotherhood, are viewed with a great deal of scepticism themselves by a lot of the younger people in the country. They're seen as quite ineffectual. You had your chance, you missed out, you didn't do anything about it. We were the ones who actually, you know, pushed this forward. And we understand the consequences should we, you know, we're not, as people portray us, these sort of, like, masses that blindly follow the teachings of a, or any given religious leader just because they say so. It doesn't happen. We understand the consequences. We don't, in Egypt, we don't, you know, I'm speaking at for Egyptians, but this is a common thing. We don't like Israel. Egyptians don't have any great fondness for Israel. It's no secret. But Egyptians aren't going to risk the stability of their country and cancel the peace treaty that Egypt signed with Israel in the late 1970s. That cold peace with Israel will continue. And any party who comes out and stridently says, you know, we've got to re re-establish our confrontation with Israel, that won't fly. Similar with, similarly with Tunisia. You know, Tunisia sees itself as very much a liberal, stable enclave within the Arab, within the broader North African part of the Arab world. Very strong tradition of liberalism, French-style liberalism in Tunisia. That will continue and resonate. Um, there are some, there are some chances of a greater power vacuum into which an Islamist organisation or party may enter. I think the two here are Libya and Yemen. I'm very loath to predict what will come next in Libya because it's very difficult to get a sense of who's driving a lot of this surprisingly organised, militarised opposition. They've already set up people's councils. They're conducting themselves in an incredibly and very surprisingly sophisticated way on the battlefield. They're actually engaging in military campaigns against the government. 
for a, a movement that in Egypt was young, quite wealthy English-speaking richies who could afford access to the internet romping around Tahrir Square, which is a very rich part of Cairo. Not belittling them, but this was largely part of a cohort in Tahrir Square. It's very, very different to what we're seeing in Libya. I can't see that group, the Tahrir Square group, conducting military campaigns as the Libyan opposition is. And in the east of Libya, you do have a history of operations from groups such as the Libyan Islamic Fighting Group, etc., which I think have some presence within the opposition movement. Um, elements of this have flirted and had at, at, had at a point some formal association with Al-Qaeda, but that's not really the group that's active at the moment. Um, that could potentially happen if, you know, the Gaddafi regime is going to go down in a spasm of violence and that will create a power vacuum. The other one is Yemen. The Yemeni institutions of state are also incredibly fragile. They, the government there is facing protests but has been facing a three-front civil war for a number of years. Secessionism in the south, tribal insurgency in the north and also a Shiite rebellion in various parts of the country as well. On top of this, we've now got unrest focused on toppling the Saleh regime. This, I don't think, will lead to the creation of an Islamic emirate in Yemen, but could lead to power vacuums into which Islamist organisations could step to impose sort of self-rule in pockets of the country. I think that is a potential. Not a, lot, not a highly likely potential, but a potential. Um, so... The question of what will come next, again, it varies from country to country. Egypt, I don't see the institutions of state in Egypt changing at a rapid rate of knots. The army is the biggest corporate entity in the country, it is in charge of the country at the moment. I think we're going to see a situation quite similar to Pakistan, where the army overtly or less overtly controls the country for some time to come. The key group to watch here are not the older guys, not Mohammed Hussein Tantawi, who's currently in charge, but the middle ranking to upper middle ranking officer corps. It was this group that staged the coup back in 1952 to get rid of the king, and it's this group that has this sort of heritage and sees itself as sort of protectors of the Egyptian state. And they will likely drive whatever reform package comes through, and it's not going to be a truly free liberal democracy as such, but we will see some form of electoral participation. Um, I mean, we've got Lebanon, we've got Iraq, we've got Syria, Jordan. I mean, I could keep... Yeah, because I could keep waffling for hours, so, um, yeah. Um, so in terms of the West relationship with Gaddafi, um, what do you Yeah, it's a, good, it's a tr really tricky question morally and legally. Um, there's a definite moral imperative here, in the, particularly on, on the part of the British. The British were very active at engaging Libya once it had come in out of the cold, so to speak. But the British had also had most to do with Gaddafi's um, activities when he was causing his most mischief during the 1980s. If you remember Lockerbie, the um, Libyan embassy shooting where a member of the Libyan Secret Service agent at the Libyan Embassy in London leaned out of the window of the embassy and shot a British policewoman. A whole series of events. After that point, the British had engaged Libya. The thing with Libya, though, that is really important to remember, it's only about 4% of the world's oil supply. No, 3 sorry, 6% of the region's oil supply. But it has the best quality light, sweet, crude oil in the world. Basically, drag it out of the ground and put it straight in your car. The Europeans love it, absolutely thoroughly dependent on it. So there is an imperative born of this, that the European countries were very keen to get back in with Gaddafi after about 04, 05, when he started playing ball again. However, the legal argument with that and the logistic side of that legal implications of intervening in Libya are very, very complicated. Sanctions are already imposed, and that's certainly something that can be done and should be done and has been done, freezing of assets, etc. Referral to the International Criminal Court is significant. It's only been done once before with the Bashir regime in Sudan. Um, but 
the, the bigger issues, particularly a no-fly zone. Now, a no-fly zone would have an impact on the violence in Libya. And there is an imperative, one could say, on the part of the international community to do this. How does it actually get implemented? Well, NATO initially had the mandate to do it. However, the matter on Libya through the relationship between NATO and the UN has been referred to the UN, so the UN now has to handle it. If any sort of force or no-fly zone was going to be imposed in relation to Libya, it would have to be enforced by the US 6th Fleet, which lives in the Mediterranean. So that contains its obvious problems. You know, do you allow the US to then start imposing no-fly zones on Libya? There's an important normative implication of this that Western countries are trying very, very hard, and I think doing reasonably well, I think the US has done quite well through all of this, in terms of not trying to badge the opposition movements as Western-sponsored. Remember back to right at the start of my spiel, the implications of external interference in political rhetoric in the region. This still carries weight. And as we saw this morning, when these British guys were dredged up in the deserts of Libya and sort of wheeled out and paraded around, the Gaddafi regime is already trying to badge them as external interference. So it would mean NATO, I mean, the UN passing a Chapter 7 resolution to authorise the use of force against Libya through a no-fly zone, because if the Libyan Air Force violates the no-fly zone, they get, they get shot down, and they'll get shot down by the US through the Sixth Fleet, who are acting on behalf of the UN. Um, there's also how do you differentiate between pro- and anti-Gaddafi forces. It's very, very difficult. Um, I don't think it will happen. I just think it would be logistically too tricky to impose that. And that's be because, of, because of those reasons. I tend to take the view that, at least, I mean, at least in Egypt, there was initial frustration with the Obama regime that they weren't doing much to, they weren't coming out in really overt support of the opposition movement. But the US was doing what it was trying to do. Like they sent spe this special envoy Wisner to Cairo, who knew Mubarak, knew his men, and what, in essence, these guys do is they go in there and say, okay, well, it's all off the record. You, you're gone. Let's just face facts. You're a very wealthy man, though. You, we know you've got assets here, there, and everywhere. He, how about, and you know, they, they obviously we use this language, but this is in effect what they're saying. But we know it's important for you to, to save some sort of face in terms of withdrawal, to at least claim some sort of victory. So here's a plan that we've thought up to exit, but that's very much off the books. And that didn't really work. That was what surprised everyone when Mubarak came out and said, well, I'm not actually going anywhere. And he explicitly mentioned the US in that speech, which was a big FU to the US and their efforts to get him out. And I think it was around that time that, at least in Egypt anyway, there was a shift. Because there, a, a there was explicit calls amongst the protesters at the start that were like, you know, we don't want any more US, we don't want any more Israel, you know, we want you know, re-seizing our pride in Egyptian identity. That fell away. And then there was much more positive voices being expressed in relation to the way the Obama administration has handled this. And I think that will resonate through. Again, I take that very specific view. Others differ with me. But I think they've, they've done what the only thing that they really could do, which was support it to an extent using very carefully chosen words without sort of badging these regimes as pro-US. I mean, the Bush administration was much more active in promoting opposition movements through its funding agencies, but making sure the sticker of USAID or Middle East Partnership Initiative or one of these schemes was put on them. Um, and I think that will shift or undercut some of the resonant negativity, again, at least in Egypt. The situation is different from state to state. We are seeing unrest in Iraq at the moment, protests against the government which are caught up in this, and that's much more anti-US. We had protests this morning in Lebanon from a, a really interesting group. You've got these sort of two main blocks in the country at the moment, one sort of very pro-US, one's very anti-US, led by Hezbollah. This sort of third movement which tries to undercut the sectarianism in the country. And we don't really know what their view is. Um, Tunisia is it's probably more important in terms of European attitudes. There's a great deal of frustration in Algeria toward the US, which will continue, um, because there's just a lack of action there. 
Um, but if, if I was to make an overall statement, I would say it may shift toward some greater positive reception of the US in the long run. Marginally. That's still yet to play out. Yeah, I'm just wondering, you mentioned Iraq. You're in a situation there where you're facing a revolutionary if the US have not in the US. That's a really good question. I never thought of that. Um, Yeah, that's a really, really good question. Um, I don't know. I don't know if the Iraqi regime would actually have survived that long, potentially. I mean, it really was, a, from what we saw when it was opened up in '03, how bare bones the country was being run. Um, the North was independent by that point anyway, the Kurdish region. Um, if it hadn't, and Saddam was still there, we may have seen a more volatile version of what we're seeing in Bahrain, which is this sort of movement overlaid with a clear sectarian flavour to it. Um, and possibly a toppling of the Saddam regime, but in the context of an incredibly weak state, which would have led to a greater power vacuum and potentially greater violence. So, yeah. Um, Really interesting hypothetical, though. I've got a really general question. Could you give us any idea about what the situation is like with people now trying to access things like jobs and any sort of disability or services and what that might mean for future, like, reverse revolutions if people yeah. start to get frustrated? Yeah, another very good question. This was one thing I forgot to bring up, but I think it's almost, or is probably the most critical point going forward is economic. Um, These countries across the board, but particularly the countries that have seen a change, um, will face harsh economic times to come. It's important to remember that the countries that are facing the most unrest are countries with lower GDP. It's been one of the few consistent things going on. Even Bahrain is not a big oil producer. It's in amongst <laughs> big oil producers. It's got the lowest GDP in the Gulf. Its population's increased very sharply recently. Um, but yeah, Tunisia, Libya, Algeria, Egypt, Yemen, Bahrain, Jordan, Syria, to a lesser extent, um, Lebanon, were all have all seen very harsh economic times recently, Egypt particularly, and were heading further down that track. I can't see where an economic turnaround is going to come from. The population is growing incredibly rapidly, and you do have sort of a... a new political formation that will have a measure of sort of post uprising um, goodwill for a while but that will not last long. That will not last as long as it needs to to sort of change the economic environment. What that may mean in terms of say kickback uprisings those sort of contests are reasonably fertile ground for Islamist parties to make hay in opposition. Once Islamist parties come into power in the very few circumstances we've seen, they don't do very well and tend to fall out of favour quite quickly. So that could be part of it. Islamist movements offer a measure of stability in a very insecure environment, a sense of sort of ontological st stability, plus the whole social services aspect of a lot of these movements. It's part of Islamic philosophy, and you see it with Hezbollah, you see it with the Muslim Brotherhood, you see it with Hamas, you see it with a whole range of movements. Um, but this is the big challenge. Declining revenues, decreased investment due to instability, and massive population growth is a recipe for very volatile times ahead. The only one would be the Saudis, and the Saudis have been surprisingly well insulated through all of this. They've got a pretty deep network of patronage that reaches deep into the middle class, which sort of allows it to stop that fracturing. The Saudis are very, very worried about what's going on in Bahrain. Bahrain is a majority Shia country, ruled by a Sunni minority, Sunni minority um, the Al Khalifa family. Iran has a territorial claim over 
Bahrain. Um, it doesn't say it overtly. The foreign minister a couple of years ago let slip that you know, Bahrain is part of Iran, and then Iran went, no, 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 no. But that's Iranians want Bahrain back at some point. The thing that dominates Gulf politics generally, particularly for the smaller states, but for Saudi generally, is Iran. It's fallen off, unfortunately. I think I've got a better map. It's just there. Oh. It's a little island, and the only the only thing that connects Bahrain is a causeway into Saudi Arabia. No, it's an, just an island that's very, very close to. And the thing with that also is that there's a Shia minority that lives here. It's about 10 to 15 percent of the Saudi population. And this is also the main oil producing area of Saudi Arabia, El Ramalia area. So a sectarian uprising in Bahrain scares the pants off the Saudis. And they actually came out and said, if the regime looks seriously like collapsing, we're going to send troops over the causeway. They have been, prior to this, this sectarian tension in Bahrain has been going on for a while. Um, and the Saudis have been facilitating the migration of a reasonably large number of Sunni Arabs from other parts of the region, particularly Syria and Jordan, into Bahrain to try and boost their numbers. Um, so they've come out and explicitly said they will intervene. They also have been periodically intervening in Yemen. If Yemen looks like it's going to collapse in a way that would threaten the stability of the Saudis, they would intervene there. There's no real other cases, except for the relationship between Syria and Jordan, which is kind of a different kettle of fish. But in the context of the current stuff, that would be the two. Um, yeah, I don't know if it had happened. I don't know if the Saudis would send tanks over the causeway, but they've said they would. Bahrain is home to the US Fifth Fleet and a very key... All the Gulf states are key US allies, part of this traditional monarchies group, independent from Britain in 1971, so very late on. Um, very important parts of the US strategic structure in the region. Um, well, the US would have a little choice, depending on, again, what form the uprising took. If the Iranians moved into Bahrain, the US would definitely intervene. The Iranians aren't going to do that. If the Shia uprising as it stands at the moment, they're picketing the Prime Minister's office, etc. Should that government collapse, I think the US would look to open a channel to this new government, who I think would come out and say, we pose no threat to the US position in Bahrain. You know, we'd get a lot of aid from the US by allowing the Fifth Fleet to stay here. It would only be a major rupture that would lead to the US intervening because it would lead to, it'd have to be an Iranian intervention first. And the Iranians wouldn't overplay their hand like that, I don't think. I know it may be somewhat outside your area of expertise, but I remember reading somewhere that people are hypothesizing that the growing, I guess, wave of unrest will spread to other regions. I think I heard mm. someone saying that there are riots in North Korea that have been. I've heard this too, yeah. I don't know. Um, the, I think that the, the, the particular dynamics of states, because the one you hear most is China. That this is going to have some sort of viral effect into China. Um, the major difference here, which I would say China maybe we, um, is akin to the Saudi social structure, is the depth with which the regime has clients in society, right through the middle classes that are dependent on the regime that would not want the regime to collapse or the system to collapse. That reaches much further down in a you know, big state like China. You know, people are so dependent on the state for jobs and security and just general ontological security, etc. However, you know, the other thing with that is that we don't really have a region in the world that is as so definitively characterised politically by dictatorships. It's usually democracies sort of scattered through maybe parts of sub-Saharan Africa. There are reports in, in West Africa that you know, there's some, some sort of violence linked to this emerging, places like Cameroon, etc., that they might be candidates for this sort of thing. I don't know enough about those particular countries to comment. Um, but it's, I think it's that particularity of the dictatorships with the level of external support that's quite particular to the Middle East which I think would probably quarantine it to this region.
Um, there's a whole range of issues there, um, and depending on how you prioritise them depends on your take on it. Um, Iran says, and I'll, I'll give the Iranian government a thing, they say they want it because they're allowed to have them. There is not, we are signatories to the MT, NPT, and they're not saying weapons, they're saying nuclear technology. They're saying that, well, we're signatories to the NPT, Israel's not. We follow all the guidelines. They did break the, the rules with the Natanz plant, but if we follow the rules as set out by the NPT, we need to do this, A, to ensure our energy security, even though we produce oil, we, we can export oil, we can sell oil, we can make money. Nuclear power's a lot cheaper. Why can't we do that? It's much, economically, it makes much more sense than just using our own oil and sell it for a profit and just run nuclear plants. Um, it, in and of itself, is a market. You can develop and sell nuclear power technology, which is something they could do. And they also tie in this whole thing of national pride, where they say, well, we deserve to be taken seriously. Why are we exceptionalised? Why can't we just be, you know, why aren't we treated like the US? The US is just another country. Why are we put out in the cold and told, no, you can't do this like children? That's the way Ahmadinejad's been framing it that plays a very solid populist line. Legally, putting the Natanz issue aside, Iran has, there's no restrictions that we can place on Iran to develop peaceful nuclear technology at all, if they've complied by the NPT regime. Because Australia can do it, etc., etc. And they would say, well, okay, well, if you're going to impose these limits on us, shouldn't you start with those who have violated the NPT much more overtly? And they would obviously say, Israel. Start with them. They're worse offenders than we are. Why don't... And then come to us. That's, that's their argument. Um, the weapons thing... Yeah, I mean, if you've got peaceful nuclear technology, you've got nuclear technology, and it's not a lot of steps to then develop weapons technology. Um, again, they would just trot out the argument with Israel. Israel's got them. Israel's a threat to us. They, you know, why can't we have them? 